are, uh, I see a lot of new faces. So just, if I haven't met with you, I'm Patty Smith, I do programming here, which is a fun job. Um, and we're so happy to have back Anthony Samarco by popular demand, he's been here before. Um, Anthony is a noted historian and author of over 70 books on the history and development of Boston. He lectures widely on the history and development of his native city. He teaches a popular course, Boston History, at BU, Metropolitan College, and he lives between Boston and Osterville. So without further ado, here is Anthony. I don't know why everyone is here. You all look too young to remember Howard Johnson's. <laughs> But you know, Howard Johnson's was something in a lot of ways that was part of our lives. Everyone in America knew Howard Johnson. It was an orange roof empire that went from Maine to Florida, from the East Coast to the West. And in some ways, it provided not only delicious food, wonderful ice cream with 28 flavors, but it was also something in a lot of ways that it had sensible prices. This is one of a series of books that I've been writing on not only the city of Boston, which I've done 85 books now, but the idea is that I'm doing books on the Baker Chocolate Company, Howard Johnson's, Jordan Marsh. I almost finished with S.S. Pearson Company, but I got a contract this winter to write the Christmas Tree Shop book. So I'm not gonna ask for a show of hands because I know every one of us will raise it, Christmas tree shops was another aspect of everyone's life. And whether we went there with our mothers or aunts or daughters or nieces, it was something in a lot of ways that was really a lot of fun. I'm just gonna move this a little forward. Now the idea is Howard Johnson's is something that I wrote when I was living in Milton, simply for the fact that I wanted to actually make local history not only interesting, but fun for people. Howard Johnson lived in Milton from 1940 until his death in 1971. He also kept places in Greenwich, Connecticut, on Martha's Vineyard, and of course, Fifth Avenue in New York. But he was an integral part of telling local history. And though Howard Johnson's would start in Wollaston, which is a part of Quincy, we had to realize in some aspects that it was known throughout the country. Now seen here, of course, this is a coconut cake, one of many recipes that's in the book. And we see in some ways that the cover, Howard Johnson's, how a roadside icon became an American, I can't even read it, icon. We realize in that instance that the book itself chronicles not only in text, but in color photographs, the whole history. And here's Howard Johnson. Howard Deering Johnson actually descended from Swedish immigrants. He was born in Dorchester, which is today the area of Port Norfolk in 1899. The family moved two years later to Wollaston, a part of Quincy. There he was raised and continued in school until the eighth grade. He had to drop out of school to help his father who had gone bankrupt. He was a cigar jobber and he had advance paid for a shipment of cigars from Cuba and unfortunately they came unsaleable. The company went out of business. So as a result, the boy dropped out of school and worked with his father until he entered World War I, where he served in the Yankee infantry in France. During that period of time, Howard Johnson would create a company that he branded. Today, we think of every company with a brand, logo, and even type and font. And seen here, he would actually have Simple Simon and the Pieman and the Drooling Dog as his logo. This was done by John Eagles Alcott, a very well-known graphic designer from Islington, a part of Westwood, Massachusetts. He had hundreds of clients, but the concept was he worked with Howard Johnson from 1935 when he created this logo until his death in 1972. During that period of time, it was also Alcott that created the garish colors of the orange roof and the turquoise blue shutters. And he also would design every swizzle stick, paper placemat, cup, saucer, and plate. And we realized that that became instrumental in his company being well known and recognized. But he also would solidify the base. And seen here is his son, Howard Brennan Johnson, a son of the third marriage. Howard Johnson would be married four times. The first sued him for desertion, but he even said, I worked 18 hours a day, seven days a week. 
I think I'd even feel um, somewhat alienated. His second wife died in childbirth. His third wife divorced him when the child was only a year old. And the fourth one outlived him, living in the back bay. But between these two men, from 1925 until 1981, they would operate one of the most readily identifiable, not just restaurants, but chain restaurants in the United States. Now, the story really began in Wollaston. Howard Johnson had really been raised in Quincy and, of course, had been educated there. Seen here was the granite depot of the granite branch of the Old Colony Railroad that was at Wollaston. Between the period in 1822 when Quincy became a city and the early part of the 20th century, Quincy's population would triple. And it tripled because of the accessibility. Many people could move outside of the city and with the train, not only go to Boston for business, but also for pleasure. Seen here in a postcard of 1922, we see on the right-hand side what would become Howard Johnson's corner store. Originally, it was a Walker Barlow drug store. And of course, when he purchased it in 1925 with a loan of $300 from his widowed mother and $2,000 from Dr. George Dalton, who was an internist in Quincy, he was able to sell cigars, cigarettes, newspapers, magazines, and of course, at a small soda fountain, three forms of ice cream, vanilla, chocolate, and strawberry. He did quite well, and during that period of time, the company was very solid and began to increase. But his soda fountain was something that really was the big attraction. Previous, it had always been provided that the ice cream was brought in. But during the period of 1926, he'd work with Everett Porter, the man on the far left-hand side, to begin to experiment to make what would become premium ice cream. They bought French freezers, and of course they began to make ice cream that was not only delicious, but was a little bit jarring, because even though it had been frozen, it had shards of ice. And during that period, the two men continued to experiment. They had no idea that ice cream in some ways could be so difficult. But the idea here was that Howard Johnson had heard of a man who made ice cream in Nahant, Massachusetts. And that was somebody who was by the name of William Halbauer. Halbauer is seen to the right of the door. And he himself was an immigrant from Germany. He came here in the 1870s and he peddled ice cream throughout not only Lynn, but later Nahant. He would set up an ice cream stand on Nahant Beach in 1910, and it was said that his ice cream was the very best that anyone could have in the metropolitan Boston area. Nobody could understand it. Why was it so creamy, smooth, and delicious? Well, seen here, he sold not only the ice cream for 10 cents a cone, but he also had ice cream sodas and even college ices or sherbets that we know of today. Howard Johnson met with him and he said, how do you do it? Well, Hal Bauer was a businessman and he said, well, I'll sell you the recipe. And at $300 in 1926, that was a huge amount of money. The idea was Hal Bauer made his ice cream with a 12% butterfat count. So Howard Johnson said, well, if the man's ice cream is as good as it is, I'm going to make it with 16%. As a result, not only was it the most creamy, smooth, and delicious ice cream, but it was probably one of the first premium ice creams, and he would actually coin 28 flavors. During that period, he realized that those 28 flavors went from apple to vanilla. They did regionally have differences. Sometimes New England had something different than the American South or even the Midwest. But seen here in an advertisement from 1931, this young boy winks at us. He has an ice cream cone, we don't. But it said that Howard Johnson's famous ice cream was made by a Yankee for discriminating Yankees. Well, in that instance, there were a variety of flavors. The 28 flavors were never stamped as the flavors. They fluctuated. But vanilla was said to be the one number one choice with chocolate jimmies. Still my favorite. But during this period, he became extremely well known and people began to go to Wollaston just to have ice cream. 
The next year, he decided that he would actually expand because during the period of the teens and 20s of the 20th century, many people were going bathing at the beach. The first beach was, of course, Revere Beach, opened in 1895. And of course, not everybody wore a bathing suit. You can see these two women on the lower right-hand side in white muslin dresses with a parasol. Heaven forbid one gets a sunburn. But here he decided that since people were coming, and they were coming sometimes anywhere from two to three miles, maybe they'd enjoy a cool drink or something to eat or maybe some of his ice cream. And what he decided to do was to rent a small stand that was on Quincy Shore Drive facing Wollaston Beach. He rented it for $500 for the entire summer. And there, not only did he begin to serve his famous fried clams and french fries, cool drinks, but also his 28 flavors of ice cream. Between 1926 and 1927, he would actually sell over $30,000 a month just in 10 cent ice cream cones. It was said that the Quincy Police Department was called out because people had to queue. There were only two young men behind the counter scooping the ice cream from the freezer, and it was said there were anywhere from 800 to 1,000 people in line at any given time. I wish I had a business like that. Well, it was so successful, and ice cream was so delicious, that it would eventually expand. He would open in 1927, ice cream stands at Nantasket Beach and Revere Beach, and it became quite a success. Well, by 1929, his business had really been on firm footing. He had paid off his debts, and he had a very successful corner store. But he had actually said in his biography that he wanted to actually open a store that served traditional New England food. And of course, what better place than Quincy Square? And seen here in a postcard of 1950, Quincy Square was really quite a hopping place at that time. On the left-hand side was the Church of the Presidents, where not only Presidents John Adams and John Quincy Adams worshipped and are buried in the crypt. On the right is Quincy City Hall. But in the distance was the Granite Trust Bank, the tallest structure south of Boston on the South Shore. Now, during the 20th century, we realized Quincy's population had tripled in less than 30 years. But during the early part of the 19th century, much of its business dealt with the granite industry. And the Granite Trust Bank, founded in 1825 and at that time headed by Theophilus King, was one of the most solvent institutions, not just in Quincy, but in Massachusetts. The building was 11 stories in height, not only was the bank a thriving one, but it also was very astute by putting rental property on the ground floor. And if you look at the building on the center, on either side are flanked small shops. Well, Howard Johnson met with King and not only received the shop just to the left of the entrance, but he also received a $50,000 line of credit, which was a huge sum of money in 1929 he created what he called his colonial restaurant. It actually had kitchens in the basement and facilities, but upstairs was a place that had a counter with stools as well as a dining room. He worked with a woman by the name of Helen Church. I doubt anyone has ever heard of her, but she was in Boston because her husband was actually studying at the Harvard Medical School and he did become a medical doctor. She was a trained dietitian and the two of them would eventually write, which I'm sure every one of us has, the caloric guide called Bows and Church. It's on my refrigerator, I read it as I eat. But the idea is that they would actually go on to very interesting careers. But during that period of time, she worked with Howard Johnson to create nutritious but attractive dishes. It might have been roast turkey, fried clams and french fries. It might be chicken croquet, or maybe even shrimp creole. But each of the things she did, she would try to do in such a way that it was nutritious as well as delicious. But I always wondered what she thought of the 16% butterfat count ice cream. But she was very successful, and she made some trademark dishes that were served by Howard Johnson's. He did well. He had businessmen's lunches and dinners at 50 cents a plate, and they were three courses. 
Many people shopping might stop for an ice cream or a sundae or even a cup of coffee. But by the period of the latter part of 1929, he really came into his being. Because if you see the building on the far right hand side, it's called the Quincy Theatre. Now, the Quincy Theatre had started as vaudeville, it then had silent movies, but by 1929, not only had talking movies, but it was also a rental space. Now, there's a story, and we're going to go back to it, but the idea was, in the fall of 1929, there was a play called Strange Interlude that was being performed in New York. This is something that was not only written by Eugene O'Neill, but won the Pulitzer Prize, and it was very outré. And as you can see, this woman would actually be married, and she herself, in some ways, realized that her husband had insanity on his side of the family. She decided that she would abort his child and have a child by her doctor, but not tell her husband. And in that instance, she not only had the child, but she fell in love with the doctor. Well, this was somewhat of a salacious story. And in many instances, people began to realize that this was a little bit removed from polite society. It was being performed in New York by the Theater Guild. And during that period, they had done quite well. They were due to come to Boston in early September, but the problem was, Malcolm Nichols, who was the mayor of Boston, went to New York to see the play. He went, and because it was six and a half hours long, took a break and called Boston. And who did he call? The New England Watch and Ward Society. And the play was banned in Boston. Well, the Theatre Guild had already sold thousands of advanced tickets, but nobody would allow them to perform it in Boston. Of course, it was banned. They began to call every city in town surrounding the city, and everyone refused. The only one that actually allowed it was the Quincy Theater. So if you know somebody, either family or friends that live in Quincy, you can say they're a little less moral than the rest of us. Well, the whole idea was Howard Johnson was across the street. Because people were coming out from Boston on the granite branch of the old Colony Railroad in dinner jackets and evening gowns, you know, it was a six and a half hour long play. They had not an intermission, but a dinner break. And the only restaurant within walking distance was Howard Johnson's. Howard Johnson raised his 50 cent businessman's dinners to a dollar 50 and he was making a fortune, and it continued right through to the third week of October. And we all know what happened, Black Friday, and the Great Depression hit, and people began to realize in that instance, many people couldn't even afford a nickel, let alone a dime, for an ice cream cone. Howard Johnson was in a quandary. He had a widowed mother, two unmarried sisters, and at that point, a second wife, and he had to support everyone. Well, he kept discussing this with his friend, and this is Reginald Heber Sprague. Sprague lived in Wollaston. He was well-educated, and he was a businessman, but he was hard hit by the Depression. His family owned land in Orleans on Cape Cod, and Howard Johnson one day went with him to visit with his father, Captain Sprague. Now, Captain Sprague lived just on the edge of Easton and had a large estate. And during that period, Captain Sprague said to him that if you could sustain the business, hopefully you might be able to save it. Well, the idea here was that a conversation took place between these three men. And the idea was that Howard Johnson had been providing delicious food at sensible prices, but also a delicious ice cream. And they decided to actually create a franchise. And it was thought to be the first franchise in the food industry. And the first Howard Johnson franchise restaurant was opened in Orleans. Now, if you're coming in to Orleans from Eastham, there's Route 28 and Route 6A. And it's a very simple junction. Howard Johnson said, if you're going to have a restaurant, have it on a main road that everybody sees. Well, Sprague rented this, and he basically had to buy the food and ice cream from Howard Johnson's commissary. It was the only way they could control and contain quality. And during this period, which it cost $17,000, Sprague was able to pay it off in two years. 
During that period, with a $4,000 franchisee stipend, Howard Johnson was really beginning to actually expand his business. And seen here, the second one was in Dorchester. Today we call it Morrissey Boulevard, but in our parents' day it was Old Colony Parkway. And it was the only road in and out of Boston before the Southeast Expressway. Well, in that instance, the Old Colony Parkway went by Neponset. And Neponset Circle was a major feature, and this building was built on the site. Again, a major road. You couldn't miss it, an orange roof and a marquee that was actually a neon sign. During the period between 1935 and 1940, he would open 125 restaurants, one third owned outright and two thirds as franchises. And seen here at Wellington Circle in Medford, Massachusetts, this built in 1936, is a great example of that colonial revival restaurant that not only had the orange roof, turquoise blue shutters, but a parking lot because of the ascendancy of the automobile. Howard Johnson was catering not just to local people, but he was also catering to the traveling public. And in that instance, he was somebody who would create a very attractive restaurant, colonial revival in style with five architects on staff that would work with a franchisee after they had paid their initial deposit. They would build these restaurants, not only with, as you see here in the foreground, this is Campton, Massachusetts, but you realize it had a clock as well as a light in the belfry, and at the very top, a simple Simon and the Pieman and a drooling dog weather vane. His restaurants were really quite impressive, and entering into them, you began to realize they all were similar, though not identical. This is John Eagle Zalcott, the graphic designer. And yes, he continued to have hundreds of clients, but Howard Johnson's was his biggest. He taught at RISD in Providence, Rhode Island, and he also taught evening school at Everett High School. During that period, he was somebody who would really coin the idea of Howard Johnson's, especially with the logo, as you would see, as well as the font of the name of the business. And during that period, it was not only successful, but it was something that created a place that was really quite attractive and welcoming. Well, many people realized Howard Johnson was making a go of it, and he had many different friends, some of whom were very, not only wealthy and influential, but many people who provided the wood and, of course, the roofing. Does anybody recognize this woman? This is Sister Parrish, and Sister Parrish would later own Parrish Holdley, one of the best-known interior design firms in the United States. She was somebody who was hard hit during the Depression. Her husband and she had been raised with servants, but during the Depression, she was forced to do things such as not only make her own food, but open windows. She decided that because many of her friends hadn't been as hard hit as she was, she'd go into business and design the interiors of their houses. And she became really quite successful. Well, Howard Johnson had met her, and in 1937 he said, Sister, I want you to actually create a waitress uniform. And the waitress uniform was something that she really did with alacrity. And we realized in that instance, not only was it something that was aquamarine with a check, but a white apron and white cap and cuffs. It was so successful that Howard Johnson said, I can't thank you enough, what do I owe you? And this woman said, not a penny but I'll take a lifetime supply of ice cream. <laughs> and in that instance, you realize that these waitresses seen on either side of the banquet were the face of Howard Johnson's. Now we knew the orange roof, we knew the turquoise blue shutters, we knew the marquee and neon lights, but a waitress as well as a hostess were the important parts of that by welcoming people. Howard Johnson had a good friend by the name of Frank Curry. Frank Curry had a woodworking concern in Boston South End, and he would provide the wide plank, knotty pine paneling. And his Frank, Frank Pemberton, who actually, Norman Pemberton, who had a roofing company in Quincy, would provide the orange slate for the roof. 
And here, you would also see a very efficient dining room, staffed by women with menus that not only had traditional standbys, but daily specials. And seen here at the counter, many people could simply sit for a piece of pie or cake with coffee if one was traveling, or use the clean facilities that began to spring up as if by magic throughout any turnpike road. But Howard Johnson during this period would have commissaries, and these, starting in Wollaston, not only prepared all of the food, as well as pies and cakes, as well as condiments, candy, and ice cream. And ice cream, seen here in 1940, had a young man scooping, holding four sugar cones in his hands, the different types of ice cream. I always look at this and I think apple ice cream, well, I've never had it, but it sounds delicious. But it goes the gamut, chocolate, pecan, pistachio, and even vanilla. This was an important feature. And during this period, Howard Johnson was becoming very well known. In the 1930s and 1940s, we saw simple advertisement. But by the 1950s and 1960s, John Alcott would also do full-size pages in nationwide magazines such as Look and Life. And here we see three young children at the counter looking at the backboard that had the 28 flavors of ice cream. But I want you to look at the man on the left. He's a typical man that worked behind the counter scooping the ice cream. But do you see the scoop he's holding in his hand? That was specially designed because Howard Johnson wanted it when his ice cream was scooped. Not only did it have a cut-off pyramidal type, but a throat of ice cream, so it was larger than anyone else's ice cream cone, and twice the amount for 12, 10 cents. Well, these children were like typical things. I could see all of us probably at the counter, but they were his own children and one of his nephews. And here in a photograph, we see on the left-hand side, his nephew, Timmy, in the center, his daughter, Dorothy, from the second marriage, and his son, Howard Brennan Johnson, on the right, from the third marriage. Well, I think we'd all smile if somebody gave us an ice cream sundae, an ice cream soda, or even an ice cream cone. But it says everything's better than make-believe at Howard Johnson's. A lot of times, these children were used, even as babies, in their father's advertising. And one of the biggest things they did was roadside billboards. And the children's faces would be there smiling, holding ice cream. It would say, we love our daddy's ice cream, and so too won't you. And in that instance, it was something that made people smile. And you have to realize that smile would translate into sales. Howard Johnson was a master of advertising and marketing. And we began to realize that by 1938, towards the end of the Great Depression, he was actually making over a million dollars a year. And seen here, he had a four bedroom house on Summit Avenue in Wollaston. The house still stands, it's a very attractive house. It overlooks the city of Boston, but he was really quite a successful man. He was also somebody recently divorced, and we realized in that instance that though he had his two children and he was the custodian parent, he was also somebody who was looking to expand the business even more. Now in 1939, seen here in a photograph, he would have his children just prior to them going to boarding school. The daughter went to Dana Hall, the son went to Milton Academy and later Phillips. But seen here, they're sitting in the living room and their father reads to them, not from a book, but from the history of Howard Johnson's. Now, it was only founded in 1925. What could have happened in 13 years? Well, the history, which I have a few copies, is triple spaced and it's only three pages in length. The other 37 pages are a list of every ice cream stand or restaurant in the United States. He had expanded so tremendously without losing quality control that he was actually known better by his name on the business than his name as a person. And people began to think, who is Howard Johnson? How can he do this? Well, in some ways, these children were really quite testimony to not only his support, but educating them. He also was somebody who would say in advertisements, 
that it went from Maine to Florida, and that Howard Johnson's famous ice cream had 28 flavors. They had ice cream shops and restaurants. And in this instance, with these beautiful lithographs, especially in advertising, he was making his company known throughout the United States. Now, surprisingly, a man who was making a million dollars a year during the Depression decided to move. And he moved to the next town over, which is Milton, Massachusetts. Now, this was on Brush Hill Road, just around the corner from where I lived. I lived on Canton Avenue. So this house, which was built in 1917, was owned initially by N. Penrose Hallowell, a very well-to-do family from Boston. But it wasn't to live in. He built this because his children were boarding at Milton Academy, and he wanted them to have a place to go on weekends where they could have their own bed and home-cooked meals. The family lived in Boston's Back Bay and Park Avenue in New York, and this house was used right up until the time that the last child was educated. They sold the building in 1939, along with 14 acres of land, to Howard Johnson. Now, Howard Johnson, in the 1940 street listing for Milton, lived in this eight-bedroomed house, 10 bathrooms, 14 acres, not only a tennis court, but also an eight-car garage, with a housekeeper, a butler, two live-in maids, and a chauffeur. Kind of a nice life, especially since his children were at school. Well, in that instance, he not only bought it, but lived in one of the nicest neighborhoods in Milton. And many people began to realize, why would he need a house of this size? Well, he bought it for business. What he did was to have Frankfurter roasts on the back lawn. Remember how a Johnson was known for having grilled frankfurts and creamery butter? They weren't hot dogs. These were 100% beef. But the idea was, if you're going to sell a franchise, you've got to sell it to the highest bidder. $4,000 in 1939 and 1940 was the price of a very lovely house. And he said, if you buy a franchise, my architects work with you, and of course you provide, you're provided with all of the food and ice cream. You can't fail. Well, seen here in a photograph of 1942, Howard Johnson is in the very center. And to see on the upper left-hand side is a flap of the marquee that was erected. This marquee was probably four times the size of this room. He would invite anywhere from five to 600 men and women. Both men and women did buy the franchises along with their spouses. And the idea was to provide something that not only was recognizable, but also as an inducement. Well, the recognizable thing was it was a Frankfurter roast and the only food served were frankfurters in toasted buns. But in the four corners of the marquee were open bars, and you could drink to your heart's content. In that instance, the more alcohol one consumed, of course, the more likely they are to buy a franchise. And the two men on either side did. On the left-hand side is Irving Cotter. He lived in Fairfield, Connecticut, and he eventually bought two franchises and was running them as late as the early 1970s. The man on the right with his hands in front of him is George Larson. Has anybody ever heard of George Larson? Well, George Larson did buy a franchise and he opened it in Wellesley Square, and it did wonderful. However, Howard Johnson showed up for a cursory check and he was selling a coconut cake that his Aunt Maud had made. It was verboten to serve anything that was not provided by the commissary. Well, George Lawson became a little bit perplexed, and he was also quite determined. He sold his franchise back to him, and he opened his own restaurant. Do you remember the Pillar House at Route 128? Which became equally successful, even though it was only one location. So people that were buying these, in some instances, were businessmen, but there were lots of widows that Howard Johnson would help, not only to finance the $4,000, but also to assist, and it became quite the success. 
Well, in 1940, Fortune magazine, which I'm sure we read every Friday, is a magazine that actually had an advertisement that was, who is Howard Johnson? Again, everyone knew the name, but who knew the man? Well, amongst the 18 pages were color photographs. And this disembodied hand holds a chocolate ice cream cone. And it says, the boss, it's my favorite. But this wasn't any chocolate ice cream. Howard Johnson made this with real Belgian fudge and 16% butterfat. It was the best chocolate ice cream on the market. And at 10 cents, a bargain. During that period, they would actually do wonderful illustrations as well as a fantastic story. And they realized in some instances, if you did buy a franchise, you had to attend what he really called the Howard Johnson Institute. You bought the franchise, $4,000, some people financed it. And then you took a course for eight weeks, 40 hours a week, five days a week. And one of the courses was statistics. The man on the right would teach the course. One of the things they would encourage the young men and women who were, and older men and women, becoming franchisees was to make up a plate, either for luncheon or dinner, which they were gonna eat afterwards. But if you put too many french fries or too many clams, or you really had one extra slice of turkey, granted it was generous and it looked wonderful, but if you continue to do that, at the end of the month, you cut into um, profits. And what Howard Johnson's statistician said, always start with a piece of parsley <laughs> that took up at least one fifth of the plate. And of course, you could put it around. And it looked delicious, it looked lovely, but you were saving space on the plate. Well, Howard Johnson really did do well. And in that instance, his advertisements, not only in New England, but throughout the Eastern Seaboard were legendary. In 1939, we were to have the New York World's Fair, which was hopefully something that would be the end of the Great Depression. It was to take place in Rigo Park, New York, a part of the city, but adjacent on Long Island. And seen here, Howard Johnson wanted to build the largest roadside restaurant in the United States. This was really quite substantial. His own architects designed it, but it could seat 1,100 people at any given time. It was gonna cost a small fortune. At that time, $600,000, or what today is the equivalent of almost $18 million, just to build it. And he needed a partner. The idea was, not only was it to be built, but it was to be the largest orange roof in the world. Well, it was actually on the avenue going to the New York World's Fair. So if you were going by foot, bicycle, bus, or even automobile, you had to pass the restaurant. And it went down, and you can see the perisphere on the upper left-hand side. Well, this restaurant was built specifically for that, but it was expensive. And he actually would work with this woman, Lydia Gove. Has anybody ever heard of Lydia Gove? Well, Lydia Gove lived in Boston, but she was also somebody who worked for her grandmother's business. Her grandmother was a Quaker widow who had started Lydia Pinkham's Medicine. And Lydia Pinkham's Medicine was supposed to cure any female ailment. Now the idea was it was 98% alcohol, so it probably cured every male ailment as well. But it survived FDA scrutiny. And in 1922, her father, who was president of the company, graduate of both Harvard University and the Harvard Law School, was making $500,000 a year. I think our grandmothers actually use Lydia Pinkham Medicine more than we realize. She was the treasurer of the company and she was making $300,000 a year. She had been educated at Mount Holyoke and at Radcliffe, and she was a very astute woman. Seen here, she was also interested in aviation, and she actually provided scholarships for young women at Mount Holyoke and Radcliffe, as well as aviation scholarships for men and women. And at that point, she put up $300,000 to match Howard Johnson's and they actually would invite their nearest and dearest to the opening night at Rigo Park. Now this was a restaurant that had 
Murano glass chandeliers from Venice, inlaid banqueting ch chairs, which were done in burgundy velvet, inlaid carpeting, wall murals by the best New York designers. And it was something that not only served breakfast, but even late night suppers. Opening night, they invited 400 of their nearest and dearest friends and family. And seen in the center, Howard Johnson's in white tie, she's just to the left dripping in emeralds, which was her trademark jewel. But they were people that had friends who had never probably been to a Howard Johnson. And when they sat to dinner, they ordered from the menu. And people began to realize that some Howard Johnson restaurants might even have prime rib or steaks or chops, as well as baked macaroni and cheese, and of course, chicken croquette. But this was something that you realized that was open from 4 a.m. until midnight daily. And people would actually go, not just to that restaurant, but they began to realize it was actually something that had a novelty. They coined this wonderful gold coin in 1939. You can see on the obverse, it says New York World's Fair 1939. On the obverse was Simple Simon and the Pieman of the Drooling Dog. It had no monetary value. But if you had one of these coins and you were going by the Rigo Park Howard Johnson's, 10% was taken off your meal. So whether you had a cup of coffee or a piece of pie or a full meal, 10%. I mean, I'd go. I'm a bargain hunter myself. These two coins, because the World's Fair was two years, 1939 and 1940, had a seven million turn each year. So if you think of seven million with 10%, you can imagine what the gross sales were. It was a great success and everyone loved it because it was said over two million people had gone to the New York World's Fair. In that instance, Outside was the biggest neon sign in the United States. Ironically, he had 28 flavors of ice cream, but it was 28 feet in height. So if you missed the orange roof, which was the biggest one in the world, how could you miss this colored neon sign? And what does it say? Not only 28 flavors of ice cream, it had a grill, cocktail lounge, special luncheons, steaks, chops, and chicken, fried clams, and their special frankfurts. Everything under the sun, as well as daily specials. Well, during this period, Howard Johnson had become the ideal place. It was family friendly. It also had attractive colonial revival style restaurants, and this is in Summerfield, New Jersey lovely place, actually right on the highway, that you could actually stop. And during that period, the company continued to expand, so much so that there was even one opposite the Bourne Bridge. Now, in this instance, he bought the land on the Cape side of the Bourne Bridge, and he would also buy the land on the Sagamore side of the Sagamore Bridge. You might know that as the old Christmas tree shop. But these two places only saw the one built at Bourne. And again, either arriving on Cape Cod or leaving, maybe you had the first or your last fried clams, french fries, coleslaw and tartar sauce, rolls and butter for $1.35. It was a great attraction. Good food, consistent. It tasted the same in Bourne as it did in Maine or Florida. And people began to realize in some ways that Howard Johnson's advertising, as it says, it was America's choice, didn't just have a menu of traditional standbys, but daily specials, but it also had people that would work for him, an average of 25 years. Longevity was something that was well known in the business, but they also would have one of the first family-friendly restaurants with a menu just for children. And in 1937, you can see Simple Simon and the Pieman and the Drooling Dog, Howard Johnson's menu for children. Not only was it child size in portion, but it was child size in price. So parents and grandparents thought, what a bargain. And the children really did love it. Maybe they ordered the Miss Muffet lunch. Petite fresh vegetable plate, a bacon strip, rolls and butter, and ice cream and a beverage for 75 cents. Well, the Tommy Tucker plate, and what a quote, the pie man, the three bears bait, 
the Jack Spratt plate or the Mrs. Spratt's plate. This was something that made the children feel a part of it. It wasn't just wonderful food, but it was made specially for them. Now, during the 1940s, we began to realize they would also expand these initial menus into a baseball cap. And this was something that says the big league hat. The child might place his or her order for whatever fancied their palate, and then they could place it on their head like a baseball cap. And again, it was something that kept the children hopefully quiet. But they also created for breakfast the Mr. Pancake Face menu. After you had placed your order, hopefully for pancakes and sausage, with the aid of twine or yarn, you could then affix this to your face and either entertain your family or torture the people in the adjacent banquet. <laughs> but each of these were an important part of the child's upbringing. And you began to see in some ways, whether it was a child in a high chair or children sitting in the banquet, they were all welcome. Well, the surprising thing is, as I mentioned, Howard Johnson's children and some of his nephews and nieces were used in these advertisements. Here, Howard Johnson, this is 1948, actually hands an ice cream cone to his daughter, Dorothy. Dorothy is always beautifully dressed. Her hair is perfect. She smiles politely as she reaches for the ice cream cone. Unfortunately, his son, I think, got the wrong flavor. <laughs> and in that instance, is grimacing. But as I mentioned earlier, these were children used on billboards, remember. We love our daddy's ice cream, and so too won't you. Between 1938 and the World War II's end, Howard Johnson received the concessions on the Massachusetts Turnpike, the New Jersey Thruway, the New York Turnpike, the Pennsylvania Turnpike, and the Ohio Turnpike. And he worked with Esso. Do you remember Esso Gasoline? Esso, where you could fuel up your car, and Howard Johnson's adjacent to it, where you could use clean facilities and then stop for lunch or dinner or simply an ice cream cone. During that period, the company was catering to the traveling public. And in some ways, the advertisement showed the breadth of the people that enjoyed Howard Johnson's. This done by John Alcott said, Howard Johnson's was a haven for the folks, but it was heaven for the kids. And of course, the children come on foot, by scooter, walking sticks, pogo, even a perambulator. And we realized that young children loved it, and they had their own menu. But so too didn't young teenagers. Um, if you haven't realized it by now, Teenage children can be very difficult. Here, a young girl sits in a jalopy applying makeup, obviously not from Cohasset, and she actually says, you men are all alike. Well, the man on the foreground says, what a dish, 28 flavors, and a dish of ice cream comes to his mind. I think it's the dish in the car. And you realize the little boy paints the 28 flavors of ice cream on the side of the automobile. Again, teenagers liked it. And even young married couples in 1949, the bride and groom sit in a yellow convertible and the bride says to her groom, can't you think of anything but 28 flavors? And what does the husband say? Nothing except those frankfurters and fried clams, the hurry up service and sensible prices. Young people getting married in 1949 obviously were very different. And a few years later, mother and father have three children. Now their convertible is red. Father's hairline has receded, as well as his hat is shrunk. Father drives to the restaurant and says, 28 flavors, 28 flavors, 28 flavors, that's all I ever hear. And the little boy in back says, and don't forget the frankfurters or the fry clams, or those piggyback prices. This appeal to the public and they were seen in nationwide magazines, full color. And it was something that continued to boost the company, not only for sales, because you could buy at the commissaries, but also to dine at Howard Johnson. During the period of the 40s, especially during World War II, when there was a ration on gasoline, they decided to do certain things that would actually appeal to the public. And he would ask not only his franchisees, but his own restaurants, to serve a dessert to every woman that came into Howard Johnson's on Mother's Day. 
And here, mother with her hat, pearls, and corsage is served a Sunday with fruits in season. It didn't sound like a lot, but it made a difference. And during World War II, he decreed that any man or woman who arrived in uniform was to be served their meal free of charge. And in that way, a small gesture went so much further than many people realized. And people looked at it as something that was very kind. Well, in that instance, they also did an advertisement for children under the age of 12. Now, look at the colors. If you got this, I don't know if you know, but I'm colorblind, but I can see that. Howard Johnson, during the period of 1946 to about 1960, did a thing for any child under the age of 12. And it said that Howard Johnson wishes you a happy birthday and invites you to a birthday dinner. Can you imagine getting this in the mail? Well, parents and grandparents were encouraged to send in the child's birth date, their name and address. A couple of weeks before the child's birthday, they'd get this invitation. Oh, would you refuse? A free meal? A birthday cake? Lollipops? Hats? I'm there. Well, you had to go on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, the slow nights, and you had to be accompanied by an adult. Well, the idea was that this advertisement had a 62% return. And of course, one isn't going to go with their child. Both parents are going to go, probably all four grandparents, aunts and uncles and siblings. And it was said that the average dinner for a 12-year-old was 11 people and it was on a slow night. It was a great advertisement, and it really did make a difference. But you see here, with Simple Simon and the Pieman and the Drooling Dog, which was a three-dimensional logo that was placed on the business, he would actually have these, which actually said to our patrons, we desire to maintain and as far as possible to improve on our high standard of food and service. The entire satisfaction of, your, of my patrons of, is of vital importance and your opinion will be a helpful guide. So maybe the hostess was surly, maybe the waitresses were chatting when they should have been taking the order. Maybe your ice cream was a little bit melted when you got it. If you actually sent in a note with your name and address and telephone number, how Johnson would go through them and he would call you himself. The idea was if it sounded plausible, and of course many people can complain, but in a nice way, he would send you six vouchers for six free meals. Now isn't that a nice thing to say in some ways? Well, my ice cream was a little bit melted and I really thought it was going to be nice and hard so I could enjoy it. Well, disappointment does happen, but Howard Johnson realized the happiness of his patrons was the ideal because it actually pursued his business goals. And he did well. Seen here in that 1940 Fortune magazine, one of the beautiful illustrations was this disembodied hand holding fried clams and french fries. Fried clams was something that was said to be as sweet as a nut. But in the 1930s to the 1950s, they came from the Ipswich River in Ipswich, Massachusetts. During that period, they had a company by the name of Sofran Clam Company that was their sole purveyor of clams to Howard Johnson's. The Sofran brothers, and there were four, actually came from Kalamata in Greece and with their parents came to this country in 1919. They initially worked in the hosiery industry in Ipswich, and later they became fishermen, specializing in clams. After they got their concession in 1936, they actually set up these clam shacks, and most of the women that worked there were of Greek descent. Some didn't speak English, but they shocked clams daily, seven days a week. And when they got the clams, they were paid according to the weight of their canister, but they were then brought to George Sofran, the eldest of the brothers, where he would place them into one gallon cans with the Howard Johnson logo. They'd be sealed and taken by biplane to whichever the commissaries they'd be distributed. By this period, there was a commissary in Wollaston, Taunton, Brockton, and Rego Park, New York. Well, Sofran did extremely well, but you had to realize they were catering to Howard Johnson. 
And you also have to realize that the Ipswich River was just so big. So by the period of the late 40s, it was getting more difficult to get clams, which were whole belly Ipswich clams. And seen here, they were always served either with French fries or in a clam roll. It looks delicious. I've had lunch, but I would actually have this if, if it was real. And during that period, they began to realize they had to expand their harvesting of clams. And one of the things they began to do was to go to Digby, Nova Scotia, as well as Hilton Head, South Carolina, and they would actually harvest hen clams. Now, whereas a full-bellied Ipswich clam was small, but with a full belly, the hen clams were about the size of a bread and butter plate, and they would be cut into strips and fried. They were the first clam strips to be served to the American public in 1951. Howard Johnson called them tender sweet fried clams. So whether you like whole bellied or clam strips, seen here, George Soffron on the right and Howard Brennan Johnson on the left, you had to realize for $1.35, it was probably one of the most flavorful and delicious meals you could imagine. During that period, the Soffrons worked for the company for 36 years and they were actually very successful. But they also required every franchisee to roast six turkeys daily. Can you imagine? Seen here, it says, take a tip from Rudy Valley. How to succeed in carving a turkey without really trying. Number one, put the family in the car. Number two, head for the orange roof. And number three, order Howard Johnson's turkey special. And at $1.49, it was freshly carved turkey, real mashed potatoes, a vegetable, cranberry sauce, and rolls of butter. It was almost as good as if it was at home. But turkey could also be made into sliced turkey sandwiches, turkey salad, and a variety of things, including turkey soup. But they also, by that period, began to upgrade their children's menus. Now, maybe you remember, by the early 1960s, these menus were about 12 pages in, in length. They not only had history type things, this is the history of rocket science and NASA in the United States. They had the history of ancient Egypt. They had the history of metrics, the history of ancient China, or even Native Americans. And once the child began to look through it, in the very center was the menu. After having placed his or her order, they could then begin to look at not only the historical things that were always beautifully illustrated, but some of the games that were in the small menu. One of them was this, and it says, try to print these numbered letters in the like-numbered squares below. So if number seven is a Q, and number four is a U, and number nine is an A, the child might spell the word quality. Oh, what was Howard Johnson's food if it wasn't quality? The child would be happy that he or she had actually spelled the word correctly. Parents and grandparents didn't actually miss the connotation. These were things, again, that kept the child quiet until they actually had their lunch or dinner. And many people began to realize that Howard Johnson's was really more than just a restaurant. It was a place, it was a destination. But on the back of every one of these new menus was this game. And it says it's the Howard Johnson ice cream game. Check the popular flavors as you try them. Well, all 28 flavors are there, including a few blanks. But you would actually see the children competing because if you had every box checked, what did you get? A free ice cream cone. Can you imagine your grandchild wanting to play this four or five times a day in July and August? Well, in that instance, it also says, ask mom and dad to stop at a Howard Johnson's. Well, it was a great success and people loved it. Children did especially. But seen here in 1959, Howard Deering Johnson would step down as president of the company. This is at the Southeast Expressway Howard Johnson restaurant at Boston Street in Dorchester. He not only had actually started the company in 1925 in debt, but in 1959, the company was valued at $750 million. 
This was a man who had actually done things that many people thought he could never do with an eighth grade education. But the idea here was he no longer was president, but he became chairman of the board and treasurer. And he handed the business to his only son, Howard Brennan Johnson. Unlike his father, this young man was well-educated. He attended Moses Brown in Providence, Milton Academy, Phillips Andover, Harvard, Yale, and the Harvard Business School. During that period, he was equipped to run a multi-million dollar company, and he did well the very first years. In that instance, he did one thing initially, which was to move the offices from Beale Street in Quincy to Rockefeller Plaza in New York. But he also was to put the company onto the New York Stock Exchange. This stock was something that between 1959 and 1971 saw over one billion dollars of stock sold. Now I have to realize a billion dollars at that time would be the equivalent today of about 14 to 15 billion dollars. In that instance, if you liked Howard Johnson, maybe you could buy a share of stock or maybe a block. And it was something that continued to provide cash to again, expand the business. But he was also somebody who really streamlined the architecture. During the period between 1961 and 63, he had Rudolf Nims, an architect from Atlanta, Georgia, create a prototype that would be every restaurant built after that time. Granted, it had an orange roof, but it had a dining room on the left, the counter and stools on the right, and facilities in the kitchen in the middle. These were things that didn't change, and it was standardized, it reduced price, and of course the architects could be let go. It also had a parking lot for at least 100 automobiles. And during that period, the company continued to do extremely well. Many people realized that Howard Johnson Jr., so to speak, was somebody who not only had 50 vice presidents, but he was commanding well over 15,000 employees. And you saw here in 1965, one of the beginnings of the foibles. Now, when you think about Howard Johnson's in the 60s and 70s, it was really thought of as a place your grandparents would go for dinner. It wasn't always up to date or anything of that sort. The food was okay. It wasn't as good as it had been. But one of that thing that Howard Johnson wanted to do was to update Sister Parrish's um, waitress uniform. He didn't go to somebody local. He went to the House of Dior in Paris. And he would actually have these women parading around to actually show him the different designs that he would then ask the waitresses to vote upon. I think they would have preferred a raise rather than wearing haute couture while they served at table. But in that instance, it was something that cost $25,000 at that time and was a great failure. And seen here is the uniforms. This is Asbury Park, New Jersey. The hostess in the center is very well dressed, but you see the waitresses wearing the new House of Dior waitress uniform. Well, in some ways, he was somebody who wasn't reinvesting in the business. He had competitors, but of course, Burger King, McDonald's, and even Kentucky Fried Chicken combined could not equal Howard Johnson. Have you ever heard of the Red Coach Grill? Well, the Red Coach Grill, oh, you're not that old, come on. But the Red Coach Grill had been founded in 1937, and there were 11 restaurants in and around the Boston area. They had a red roof, and their logo was a stagecoach. They served fine steaks and meats, as well as fine seafood. And it was something that was a great competitor to Howard Johnson's thousands of restaurants and ice cream stands. Well, rather than compete against them, the sun bought them out. And it caused a cash flow problem. And now the Howard Johnson absorbed Red Coach Grill. They would also buy Mug and Muffin. Don't ask me why, because it wasn't a huge concern, but they bought them out as well. And during this period, Howard Johnson, in some ways, was also working at his commissaries to not only begin to freeze food, which you're doing so much, to actually see that if it would melt, not melt, but defrost without losing its consistency, he was somebody who realized that he had a lot of work to do. During that period, the company from 1952 on also had a motel chain. 
And the motels, the first one being in Savannah, Georgia, was a place where you could stop, as well as having a restaurant adjacent to it. It had clean rooms, a pool, a television, even a radio. But it was something in some ways, again, that provided a very pla nice place for people to stop traveling the road. By the period of 1980, there were over 800 motels throughout the United States. But in this instance, you realize that this was a company that was actually having these roadside restaurants, and this is the one in Orleans, Massachusetts, at the junction of 28 and 6A, that still survives today, but known as Bulldog Pub. Now, the surprising thing is, this is also the location of the Christmas tree shop. It's recently been closed, but you realize in that instance that everyone had gone to this restaurant. Does anybody recognize this woman? Even with the sunglasses? Well, she's leaving the all-you-could-eat fish fry at the Hyannis Rotary Howard Johnson's. And we see Ethel Kennedy on the left-hand side. It didn't matter who you were, and it didn't matter if you were a jet-setting billionaire. People went to Howard Johnson because, again, people felt it was something that was not only good value for the money, but it was a reliable standby. Well, by the period of the 1980s, Howard Johnson had fallen on hard times. The father, in the 1950s, had hired a French chef by the name of Jacques Pepin. We might know him from the Create Channel and Channel 2. He's somebody in some ways that's become uh, the successor to Julia Child. And though he was working as a chef at Le Papillon in New York, he was hired by Howard Johnson to work in his commissary. And in his autobiography, he speaks about the fact that he would make 200 gallons of clam chowder. He would also debone 100 turkeys daily. And he was also a man who began to experiment with the freezing of both chowder, turkey, and all sorts of other things. During that period of time, the company was changing. In some ways, you began to realize that the old idea of the 28 flavors of 16% butterfat ice cream, with of course 28 different varieties for every palate, was becoming something of the past. During that period, the son, seen here with his father in 1972, would dedicate this granite marker at the location of the first corner store of the Howard Johnsons on Beale Street in Wollaston. As it says, this was the first site of Howard Johnson's store, opened by Howard Johnson on September 3rd, 1925. This commemorative marker was erected by Howard Johnson's through the courtesy of the Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority and the city of Quincy in 1972. Well, the founder died a month later, and in 1981, the son sold the business. It was sold to Imperial Group, a British conglomerate. They primarily own pubs and uh, motels and hotels throughout the British Isles. The company was valued at $135 million. Remember, in 1959, it was valued at $750 million. The company had failed tremendously, and when they received the company, they realized there were two sets of books. The company initially sold off all of the motels to the Marriott Corporation, but they couldn't touch the franchises. It was a legal entity, and it was called La Mancha Group. And in that instance, if you ran that franchise, you could still call it Howard Johnson's, though you couldn't purchase food from the commissary any longer, but you could still use it. But if you sold out, you could not have somebody take the name. Up until about two years ago, there was the last Howard Johnson restaurant in uh, Lake George, New York. So we realized that hundreds of these restaurants and hundreds of these motels would eventually close. And the whole idea was, it wasn't just Howard Johnson seen here with the simple Simon and the pieman and the drooling dog. It was something that was a place in time in the 20th century. It was a place where we, our parents, our grandparents, and sometimes even our great-grandparents would actually go for a simple meal. But the whole idea was, it's a delicious memory from the past. This book, in some ways, chronicles that industry from 1929 until 1981. And we begin to realize that almost every one of us has actually known and enjoyed it. 
But we have to realize in some ways, again, it's part of Lost Boston. Thank you, I hope you enjoyed it.